Hello, I'm Donald McCauley and welcome to MedicsVoices.com, where we talk to the key opinion leaders in healthcare and medicine around the world. Today we're in Australia and I'm talking to Grant Russell. Grant, you've had a fascinating career. I mean, starting off in Perth, then to Ottawa and then back to Australia. Tell us about your career and what, what you learned from all that travel. Yeah, I start as you said, I started off going into general practice in Perth and always feeling that I, I just really whilst I love whilst I love and I continue to love consulting and just being with patients through the day, I'm I really had always loved an, another little string to the bow. So I did GP obstetrics until we were sort of priced out of the market with insurance in the early 90s. And then uh, palliative care in general practice for a while. And then I answered an advertisement by putting an application in to get a, a scholarship to do a PhD. And I could go anywhere in the world to do it. And I was very lucky to go to um, the University of Western Ontario, to Moira Stewart's team. And it was one of the best decisions that I'd ever made. Sort of changed my life. I, we, we were there for a couple of years wife and couple of kids and then we went back to it back to Perth and then the phone rang one day and one of maybe one of your future interviewees uh was on the other end Bill Hogg and he said we've we've got too much money uh and we need to have some people to do the work and I said oh Bill it's all too crazy at the moment I'm we've just opened a practice and blah 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 and, so every month for the next six months, the phone rang again and he kept on ringing and the, and the deal got better. And by the end, I just couldn't say no. So I, I was with um, with the unit, uh, the CT Lamont Centre in Ottawa for four and a half years. Then we decided that let's get the growing family back to Australia. And I've since then, I've been at um, Monash University in Melbourne. I try to get over to Perth as much as I can, but there was a uh, the issue of a global pandemic, which made things a little bit difficult for a few years. Yeah, so and we in Melbourne, we uh, sort of started to set up a essentially a health service linked research unit and uh, in the outer suburbs of, of Melbourne. And it was a fascinating area, a lot of refugees and sort of that then led to a number of, of other collaborative projects. So it's been an interesting journey of which I couldn't really predict, but I continue to see patients a couple of days a week and uh, still really enjoy that. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting how it all gets put together again, eventually in time. You've worked with Bill Hogg and Moira Stewart. Now you're one of the key opinion leaders. So what do you tell your junior colleagues when they're setting out in their career? So I'm still a true believer in family medicine, primary care. And I think that there is a very wonderful career that can be forged. There's, and that it's based in many ways around, I've, I've, and I learned this from Moira Stewart, it's based around the relationship with, with the individual. And if that can be valued and treasured, then a lot of the rest of it can, can fall into place. I think you need to choose a practice of people that you're, that you can talk to and who understand you and you understand them. And that the more, I think the more multidisciplinary that we can uh, more multidisciplinary a a context that we can in, in embrace. I think that is good for us in a professional sense. As far as sort of adding educational research to your life, I think one of the things I've said to young doctors has been: make sure you can be a clinician first. And there's a lot of there's there's a lot of encouragement to sort of it, certainly in Australia to get away and do your PhD straight away. We've had a number of people that we've been in contact who've done that, and it's almost been at the end of it they've sort of worried and wondered as to well what what is the future. So I guess that from my point of view, it is a very rich opportunity to be a family physician. And that those first five years after graduation, sort of through the training programs and beyond, 
are really critical. So that's a really important message for the individual practitioner in terms of their own personal career and the value of family medicine. But one of the difficulties now is that general practice, primary care, family medicine, however you describe it, is under such pressure politically, internationally. So what's your external message? What's, how can we measure the impact of primary care? Barbara Starfield really showed us that the four pillars of primary care are, are fundamental to, to measuring its success. So its ability to provide access in an unfettered way, that care can be provided with continuity, that it's comprehensive and that one of the critical roles in a complex health system for the family physician is to help coordinate the care of others, uh, the care of the individual with others. And all of those things are measurable. And one of my sort of truisms or, or aphorisms rather is that any health intervention that threat across the system that threatens access, continuity, coordination, and comprehensiveness in primary care is likely to be not beneficial at a population level because we are so intimately reliant upon the fact that family family practice does those things. Family practice slash primary care. And they're certainly, we can't be too precious about uh, professionals in the primary care sector. But um, yeah, I, I think that that's, that's one of the big lessons that uh, disrupt first person access and disrupt continuity at your peril if you're a health bureaucrat. Now, let me take you back because your academic career doesn't fit the exact formula. <laughs> <laughs> so you're primarily a family doctor. I mean, you started off and you created yeah. a practice and you were embedded in primary care. So yeah. let's talk about patients because clearly they are the most important component of everything we do. And you've written about the importance of patient-centered care. I guess there's a couple of things that everyone's got their own definition, but it's rarely fully articulated or it's very clear, really clear even to ourselves. So I was um, thinking today about, well, what are the really seminal things that have helped shape the way I think about things? And the first, I could almost name the first as being Michael Ballant's book, um, The Doctor, His Patient, uh, the, the Doctor, His Patient and the Illness. A bit of a sexist title still, but it's a, it's a magnificent book. And if anyone hasn't read it, they should. And that was pretty closely followed by Ian McQuinney's writings around patient centeredness and the and the meaning of illness. So they it sort of took me into a, and this was sort of I was only sort of barely, I don't know, wouldn't have been 30 even when I read this. And it sort of just transformed the way that I looked at at caring for people, caring for the individuals that were coming to see me. And it was sort of like a it was a, a real gift. And I, I guess it's a reflection on medical schools that they aren't, that I couldn't leave with that being something that was fully engendered. I would hope and I would anticipate, but I'm not absolutely convinced that students can leave, medical students can leave their profession with, a, with their, uh, their undergraduate training with a with a decent understanding, with a good understanding of patient centered care. Uh, to me, it's about it's about power, the power, it's about a sharing of power, a sharing of responsibility, and a knowledge of oneself and one's uh, helping to have a deep knowledge of the people whom are caring for us, uh, who we're caring for. Yeah, um, you know, the evidence is pretty robust as far as its input. Mead and Bauer uh, made a point, and they're, they're sort of major writers around patient-centered care. They made a point not that long ago that they wondered actually if we're being a bit too hard on clinicians, whereas their point and a number of others' points, and this was what I was writing about in the, in the editorial, was that it's the moral imperative of patient-centered care that really matters. So, Grant, you've talked about patient-centered care. 
Now, tell me your own experience as a patient. Did that change your view in things? That is a great question. And I've not been, without going too much into detail, or without going into detail at all, I've not been short of the odd um, health issue myself. And there's been serious health issues within our kids. And it's funny, you. I, I think I'm very attuned to listening to it, listening for it. And when it happens, it's, I sort of feel it's almost, a, I feel it with the stuff. So, wow. I mean, and it, it sort of from a personal perspective, it's, it sort of reinforces the value. Like this person has listened to me and they've, they've, they've maybe shared a little bit of their own um, viewpoint on it or maybe, but have just helped us go together, reinforce our relationship in a healing sense towards me. Um, and with, I think with our, with one of our kids in a serious illness, we actually, it was the lack of patient centeredness and the, degree of formulaic care that made us advocate for really substantial changes and I think that was a really valuable thing but you know we had uh, that was really hard but we had I'm a medical professional you know speak the language all that sort of thing it just highlighted how difficult it can be to to just um to to sort of just try and renegotiate the 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 model of care in which you embed it and uh, but that was a very interesting it's it's a very good question I'm very happy that you've asked that Grant it's always a pleasure to talk to you and thank you very much for sharing your life your educational influences and indeed your personal influences thank you very much indeed Donald thank you very much I've enjoyed it.